worship. I'd like you to turn to the book of Psalm chapter 90 as we have the junior church people be excused to go downstairs. Who's doing the teaching downstairs? Do we know? I just wondered. Thought we'd do some praying. Maybe we better pray hard. <laughs> you don't know, okay? I don't know either. I'm sure somebody has it covered. I know Floyd's not here this morning. Lois isn't here this morning. But you're here, and so am I. I'm glad to be here. Psalm chapter 90, by the way. We will turn to Genesis chapter 5 in just a little bit here. But I need to start out at this point. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the privilege we have to dig into your holy word. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for allowing us to have the privilege of reading it, understanding truth in it. Lord, as I talked with Jim yesterday, it was such a blessing to be able to know the assurance that I have in Jesus Christ, that my relationship with him is secure. Lord, I pray that you would just really touch our hearts this morning with the hope of eternal life. Help us, Lord, to face death differently when we leave than when we came. Help us, Lord, to understand it, to realize what you have done for us. Thank you now for this time. May the Holy Spirit be the master teacher and be with those at Northern Grace Youth Camp that you might just bless their hearts as Gary Leindecker ministers to them. And be with uh, Pastor David as he preaches this morning at Cross Point Church. Well, thank you for what is accomplished in all three areas. In Jesus' name, amen. The sting of death. Started thinking about this chapter in Genesis and caused me to uh, reflect upon the critical subject of dying. Um, I'm not even sure what the name of the movie is. I, I'm not a movie watcher. But in this movie, the sword fight is between Signor Montoya and this other villain, mean man. And they were fighting with each other. And this guy has been looking, Senior Montoya has been looking for this guy all his life because Senior Montoya, as you can hear the words, prepare to die. My name is Senior Montoya. You killed my father and now we kill you. <laughs> it, it was a funny, okay, uh, movie. It wasn't serious. There wasn't this gore and everything else. I think it was Princess something or another. <laughs> you tell who watched it. <laughs> That's okay. I like that. I thought it was, but I wasn't going to gander. But anyway, <clears throat> I, I enjoyed watching it. I'll put it that way. But preparing to really die is serious business. I want to tell you a story. The story happens in India. It's a true story. <coughs> Morning Star News. A story of a true Christian couple in India. They have been saved for about 10 years. The villagers realized that they would not renounce their faith in Jesus Christ after years of threats and assaults. The tribal village in the small town abused Uran and his family for three years, leaving the practice of the religion of the holy woods. They had believed for many years the religion of the holy woods, in which they would worship false god, <coughs> Sarna Taharm. And they had believed this and trusted it, and the villagers, as a collective group, worshipped 
the trees, the holy woods. They had left because of their faith in Jesus Christ. This particular religion believed that you must offer blood sacrifices to a supreme God and ritually serve him to other gods. The villagers told Uran that demons would not let him live. <coughs> the family was locked inside their house for hours. The villagers polluted the, the family's drinking water source. <coughs> Excuse me. Finally, they tied the hands of Uran and his wife behind their backs <coughs> and put them into a pond, ice cold water. And they let them be in that water from 5 p.m. throughout the entire night until 10 o'clock the next morning. Their bodies were filled with chill and, and suffering. They pulled them out the next morning. They hit Uran and his wife to renounce Jesus Christ. And Uran says, I will not deny Christ. I will continue to believe until my last breath. The couple fell seriously ill. Uran's wife recovered. Uran became paralyzed due to the nerve damage and later died. Death. You and I don't face that kind of fear in America. Please hear my next word. Yet. It may come one day in America, but not today. The lifespan average of a person living in Swansea land is 42 years of age. Excuse me, 32 years of age. If that was the average lifespan in America, I would be dead twice over. And some of you, most of you in this room probably would be near or at that point. If you lived in Japan, however, 82 years is the lifespan of that. And as a result of that, <coughs> we have to say, how long will we live in America? It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 23, that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Death one day will be destroyed. It will be all done. Jesus Christ will take care of it. 1 Corinthians 15, 55, it says that death is a sting. It hurts. Not the person who's dead. The people who are left behind are hurt. Filled with pain, grief, sorrow. Taken in thinking about this loved one that has been taken away. You and I know that when a person dies that we miss them and we have sorrow <coughs> and suffering. It is a sting. And as we th think about this whole matter of dying and the painful <coughs> sequence that follows with the survivors, death comes to us all. We realize that. Death is an enemy, and the wages of sin is dying. This morning I'd like to talk about two common statements that I hear as I minister to people at the hospital bed, as I minister to people in their homes, as I talk to people about the whole issue of dying. There's some that won't talk to me about that subject. And there are others that are very free in talking about it. But there are two statements that I hear all the time. These are the top two common statements. And I want to talk about them because they're practical. They're real. And maybe one of these or both of these are where you are at concerning the subject of death. The first one, I don't want to die. When you are visiting in the hospital room 
and the person has been told by the doctor, you only have a few hours or a few days or a few months to live. And the emotions are now filling their hearts and minds. And I come into the room and I start talking with them and they said, you know what the doctor just told me? Or I may be in the home and I went to visit the doctor yesterday and, and I'm so glad you're here and I, I want to share with you. And the doctor said, and their response is, I really do not want to face death. Would you look with me in Psalm 90, if you haven't turned there already, just a few verses here, and then we're going to sort of float around a little bit. <coughs> Psalm 90. I use this often in funerals because it's reality. It says here in verse 10, the years of our life are 70, and even by reason of strength, 80. In America, we have a longevity issue. American females will live to be approximately 81 years of age. Males, they uh, miss out on five years. Somehow, we're stressed out. It's not because of living with your wife, <laughs> it's your job the pressure, and many other factors related to it. If by reason we live to be 80, and females most of the time will live to be that. Verse 10 says, yet their span is but toil and trouble, and they are soon gone, and we fly away. How many of you, as you get older and older and older, does time slow down for you? Do you know what that means? It speeds up, doesn't it? It goes. You wake up on Monday and next thing you know, it's Saturday. You say, what, what, what did I do with the week? What happened to it? Where'd it go? Sometimes we're happy, you know. We started the garage sale on Thursday. It didn't happen until Friday morning. And it's behind us. Whew. That's good stuff. But there are things that we look forward to, and we, we look forward to with great zeal and joy, and maybe it's a, a special occasion, or maybe it's a special party. And the next thing we know, it's all done. We're back home sitting, twiddling our thumbs again, and we say, what happened? It went by so quickly. This is what we need to learn. You need to understand when there's a funeral, there needs to be something that causes the heart and the mind to start to really unwind. As much as you may dislike or hate the subject of death, I appreciate and enjoy preaching at funerals. And the reason is because people's hearts are in a different place. I get to talk about things that really matter. And some of the people that are there don't and haven't thought about dying until they get to a church or a funeral parlor and they see a dead body and they see the, the weeping or the sorrowing family. And then their heart is touched. And God uses that touch and that, that sorrowing heart to, to prepare the people to hear God speak to them, where may never listen, never go to a church even. And, uh, you know, I, I, we just had Del Byers' funeral here. I don't know how many of them are, were unsaved. I don't know how many of them may have never really, really, really uh, sat through a, a gospel presentation or, or have heard the gospel and, and had an opportunity to think it through. And so those are 
times that are very important for those individuals that were relatives or friends of the Beyer family. And, and many of you have had funerals and have had me to come and share. And those funerals have included the gospel. It will always include the gospel. Why? Because if you walk away and you hear everything else about things, the gospel is really the key issue to understand and to grasp that. Here's what it says in verse 12. Look at verse 12 of Psalm 90. So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. The people that are left behind in the aftermath of someone that is loved dying is to cause you to stop and think about life. To stop and to analyze, what am I doing with my life? Where am I going? Why am I going? You see, we, we are living in such a fast-paced world Things are happening so quickly. We get up on Monday and before we know it's Saturday. But we live in that kind of a pace all the time, all the time, all the time. We don't stop and really think about life. At a funeral, there's that hour of time to think about life. For the family, there are days of just Maybe being alone by yourself or as a group and talking and sharing. Death is not pleasant. Dying is not fun. It's not, it, it's so many people, if you really got down to it, I don't want to die. And maybe you're one of them here this morning that may feel that way. It's interesting about this whole issue of longevity of life that genetics from your family, only 20 to 30% of your longevity depends upon genetics. That means it's up to you, 70 to 80% of how long you live depends upon you. You know what I hear from the doctors all the time? Two things are important, less diet, exercise. <sighs> you mean I don't get to enjoy mashed potatoes and gravy all the time? You mean I have to get up and I have to move the body? You see, those two things are abhorrent to many Americans. And that is why we are struggling to have to maintain health, and, and what happens is how we live. As it says here, gender, genetics, access to health care, hygiene, diet, nutrition, exercise, lifestyle, and crime rates all depend upon the longevity of life. Those are all the other, but that's the, that's the 70 to 80 percent. You can only blame your mom and dad 20 to 30 percent about how long you're going to live according to this article. The oldest confirmed person lifestyle and lifespan is 122 years. Now that's confirmed. They, they haven't read the Bible, okay, so they, that's okay. The, the oldest person in the Bible, most of you know, right? And even his name. Methuselah lived to be 969 years. The second person that lived, well, you don't want to talk about that because you probably don't know. That's okay. Statistics as we think about it all. And so as we talk about the longevity of life, we find that the longevity of life is, for many, going very well. I want to go over to Genesis 5. That's where we're really ending up because that's really the theme basis of our passage of dying. Pastor Randy preached last week 
<coughs> in the week before about Cain. Cain and Abel. I want to point out one verse from chapter 4 of Genesis, okay? It says here in verse 8 of Genesis chapter 4, Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Interesting. First person to die was a, as a result of murder. I want to go to the book of Genesis chapter 5 now. Okay. Genesis chapter 5. I'm going to just look at some verses real quickly here, okay? We're, we're going to run, run, run. Verse 5 says, Thus all the days of Adam were 930 years. And the last three words of that verse are, And he died. In verse number 8 it says, Thus all the days of Seth were 912 years. And the last three words are, And he died. In verse 11, it says, Then all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and the last three words are? Hey, you are working on that one. Verse number 14 says, Thus all the days of Kenan were 910 years, and the last three words are? Oh, you can speak louder than that. That's okay. You wake yourself up. Uh, verse 17 says, Thus all the days of Mahalalel were 895 years, and? Wonderful. Verse 20 says, Thus all the days of Jared, not Jared Coos, but Jared, were 962 years, and? Yeah. Verse 27. Thus all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and? And finally, last but not least, Verse 31, thus all the days of Lamech were 777 years and hmm. eight times you have the word death. How did they die? I don't know. What did they die from? I don't know. Could be natural death, probably for all of them. They just got old. Say, well, 800, 900 years, I'd be old, all right. I mean, we have somebody that's over 95 years old. Still going. We have a number of people in our church that are over 90 years old and say, well, how would you like to live to be 777 years? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm not one. I don't care how fast and how long I could run. Some people are going to die prematurely basically because of the way they live. You know, it's, it's an interesting thing in, in the state of Wisconsin, but uh, obesity is a major problem in our state. I don't think it's because of the beer either. I think it's too many pizzas. I don't know. Uh, th we, we are challenged with that. Or the, the other activities, drug usage, alcohol usage, and many other things that are affecting our culture and our lifestyle and our health, all related to it, die prematurely. Some people are killed, as was Abel. Uh, people are killed in many different ways. Uh, there are people that are put to death. Uh, we'll talk about capital punishment some other time. We want to note there are eight times that he died. He died. He died. What God wants us to get the picture that the wages of sin in Genesis 3 is death, 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 death. And it will go on and on and on. If I ask you the question, how many funerals have you attended in your lifetime? Do you remember the first one? I do. It was either my brother or my aunt. I remember sitting in a church, looking out the window, and I had tears in my eyes as I thought about my aunt being dead. And that whole thought about, I'll never see her again. Probably about 12 years old. 
pretty impactful for me personally. I want you to go to the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, please. Proverbs chapter 3. <coughs> Want to live longer? Want to live a fruitful life? You want to live above the average person in this world? Then listen to Proverbs chapter 3. We're going to look at a whole number of verses, and it's going to tell you how to live longer. You say, but Pastor... It says, the Bible says, it's appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. Understand the appointment is death because of sin. It didn't tell you that you're going to die at the age of 48 or 68 or, or any age per se. Only 20, 30% of your past, your mom and dad through genetics, the rest is up to you. Really, how long you live is up to you. 70 to 80 percent of it. So if you die early, it's possibly your fault, if you want to use that terminology. Unless God, through an accident or some other means, takes you out of this world. But let's go to Proverbs chapter 3. Most of you know verses uh, 3, 5, 6, and 7. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. You know that? You could quote it probably. I hope you do. I already talked about it. Verse 7 says, Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Good thoughts. I want you to jump down to verse 13. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom. And the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her wisdom is better than the gain from silver and her profit better than gold. Wisdom is more valuable than money. You can be a billionaire and be foolish. God says you could be a poor person and have the most fun in life. In fact, you know what's the reality? Is that poorer people seem to have more fun than richer people. How, how is that, huh? It just tells you money doesn't give you satisfaction. It doesn't give you joy. It's not the issue of how much money you have. It's really where your heart is and what you're doing. But let's look on. Verse 16, long life is in her hand. In whose hand? Wisdom's hand. And her left hand are riches and honor. Oh, I get to have both. It's interesting that when Solomon requested uh, for what he could want from God, he says, well, what I really want is wisdom to handle the people of Israel. I want to know how to deal with them. And God says, you know, you have asked for a good thing. And I'm going to give you wisdom to rule the people. He says, but on top of it, I'm going to give you riches and honor like never a kin king has had before. And he did. You know, I'd rather have a whole lot of wisdom and knowledge about what God wants in my life than to have all the money in the world. You know, you may not agree, I know that, but that's okay. Got another verse here in verse 18. It says, Wisdom is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed or happy. But here, but listen to this. Here is where it's really wonderful. Look in verse 24. If you lie down and you have wisdom, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. How do you sleep at night? Maybe you need to read the Bible before you go to sleep. And you will sleep sweeter. Hmm? 
you know what? If you have real wisdom, you will be able to relax in God. You will be able to enjoy closing your eyes and going to sleep. Because all it is is going back to 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. Confidence. Assurance. Do you really, really know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Is the bottom line. Have you trusted Jesus Christ to be your Savior? If you have, you have the beginning of the fear of the Lord, and you have the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. It is the most important thing to understand and grasp. You have that, and no matter how stressful your life is, no matter how problematic your life is, you can have sweet sleep. That's what Proverbs is saying here. You don't have to be afraid. Did I lock all the doors? Better go check them again. Yeah, I know how that is. The older you get, the more you start to fear things. You know, when, when you're young, you just leave the door open, you know. When you get old, you put lock after lock after lock to make sure everything's buttoned up. Look what it says in verse 25. Do not be afraid of sudden terror or of the ruin of the wicked when it comes. When bad things happen in your neighborhood, when bad things happen in your life, when bad things happen to people you love, relax. God's been controlling things all these years. We, we just had this last week, not this week, last week, but the previous week, we had a Durango stolen from our near neighbor. Hasn't happened in the 29 years we lived there, but here it is. Does that cause my wife and I to fear? I won't tell you about my wife. There's concern. There are things that we may be doing differently, but I'll tell you what, when my head hits the pillow, I'm not thinking about the Durango. I'm not thinking about my cars or my possessions. I'm here to tell you, you want to come over to my place? I'll show you how to get in my house in three minutes. Five different ways. Why? It doesn't take a rocket scientist to take a sledgehammer with you when you go on visitation like that. You break down the doors, the windows, you name it. It's all yours. Understand, if they want it, they'll get it. It doesn't matter how many security locks you put on. It doesn't matter how you bolt up and, and get your house protected. When sudden danger comes and terror comes in your life, God says, relax. What's going to help you to do that? Wisdom. Look at verse 26, because this is the answer. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. It's not how many guns you have in your house. It doesn't matter if you have a 357, a 38, a 22, or a shotgun with double odd buck in it. I'm not going to protect you. God will do a better job than you will. I just heard about a family that was sleeping. And they went to sleep. And what they do down in the inner city is they get kids to crawl through the window. They get inside the house. They unlock the door. A bunch of hoods come in. And they steal three sets of keys drive off with all three cars, and nobody knew until the next morning. They had left the window open to get a little bit of fresh air. Well, they were within feet of these people that were sleeping, and they were taking all the keys and took off. Yeah. 
God is the one that protects you, folks, and does a whole lot better job than anyone else in the entire universe. You may trust in your gun, you may trust in your locks, you may trust in a whole lot of things, but here's the thing, before you go to sleep, you want sweet sleep at night? Dear Heavenly Father, while I sleep in that bed helplessly, I want you to protect me and watch over me. You see, our God is our confidence. Our God is our assurance of life. When it comes to dying, when that sudden care, you've got cancer, you've got three weeks to live. You may try all the human resources to stay alive longer. But I'm here to tell you, your confidence in God, in the right answer to be saved, is in your hands. And you better have the correct solution to the problem of going to heaven. Because if you don't, you are not going to get a second chance, folks. There is no second chance. Nice thing about playing racquetball, if you don't hit it over the line the first time, you get a second chance. Like the guy that hits a foul ball and it goes into the stands, he gets his second chance, and sometimes third and fourth and fifth. But when it comes to real life and eternity, it's a one-time shot. When you're down for the count of ten, it's the end. It's appointed unto men once to die, and what? After that, the judgment. You will face God. There will be no excuses. There will be none. I didn't know. There will be none of that. I want to tell you a story about this man. His name is Tony Simon born in 1964 to a Jewish family in Manchester, England. After he graduated from high school, his parents sent him to live in a kibbutz. If you don't know what a kibbutz is, it's a, a Jewish community. And uh, he happened to get a Christian roommate. He had a whole bunch of questions that he asked Simon, and he had no answers. So he went to the rabbis, his Jewish background, and he didn't get any answers. And as time went on, he eventually, at the age of 19, became a Christian. He trusted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. And Tony's strong faith brought him through life. And, and well, let me put some of the statistics up there. He took the gospel to 30 different countries and he was speaking to Jews and Gentiles and bringing them to Christ. As you can see here, he's got Bibles and literature wanting to talk to anybody. He was in Iraq on his last mission. He was speaking in a church meeting. He was walking back to his hotel and a car accidentally hit him and he was killed, age 53. Tony was ready to die. Tony was a believer in Jesus Christ. Are you ready to die? The physical part of it, do you have your will made out? Have all your paperwork, POAs, and all of that? The question that I'm asking you is related to loving your life. In Revelation chapter 12, it talks about the people that were being killed for Jesus Christ. They loved not their life, and they were willing to put their lives on the line and die for Jesus. You willing to do that? Somebody comes up and says, okay, I got a gun here. Deny Jesus or you're dead. What would you do? I'd say pull the trigger, have fun. All done? Would you do that? 
be willing to die for Jesus? Thousands, tens of thousands will be doing that in the book of Revelation. Are you ready to meet God? You have to answer that question. There's nobody going to be beside you saying, well, I'm, I'm, I'm here to... No, no, no. You and God. Are you assured of eternal life? I, I'm here to tell you, you can have peace in the midst of all that is going to happen to you in the future. And it really doesn't matter about the issue of dying. You must be able to have a biblical answer. This book has to give you that answer. And that's what I told Jim yesterday. I told him things and he said, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. You need to understand we have the answer. And God gives us wisdom through this book. Well, we need to move on. I want to give you a second statement. Second statement I hear often is, I don't want to die a painful death. You know, most people you talk to say, well, I'm not afraid to die, but it's how I'm going to die. You know, right now, Rich and Jim are going through a painful time in their lives. Pancreatitis. Oh, it's extremely painful. There are people that have cancer, extremely painful, have diseases and afflictions that are just horrendous. I want you to understand, there's one thing you're not going to control is how you're going to die. And if you sit around worrying about that all your life, it's going to add stress to your life and you're going to be dying sooner. And whatever your problem is. You know, many fear pain. Many fear. I, I, I don't know if you've read the Old Testament, but King Saul feared that in his life. He was fighting against the Philistines, and the Bible says some archer took a bow and arrow and phew, shot it into the air. And it hit King Saul between the breastplate, went into his body, and he was severely Wounded. Not to die, but severely wounded. He knew he wasn't going to live a whole long time. And so he turns to his armor bearer and he says, I want you to take my sword and I want you to thrust it through because I'm afraid. I'm afraid that if I live and the Philistines find me, they're going to have sport with me. They're going to pick on me. They're going to abuse me. They're going to do everything they can to make it Long and painful for me. You know what I'm talking about. And his armor bearer was greatly feared. And he would not do what Saul asked him to do. And so King Saul took his sword, he put it against his stomach, and he fell on his sword, killing himself. We call it suicide. And the armor bearer saw what he did and he says, I'm just as afraid, so he put the sword on himself and he killed himself as well. We fear death. I heard about a nurse that was in Oregon. They have euthanasia there. And this nurse was taking and putting uh, chemicals into the IVs of patients and uh, would take and uh, they would have this heart attack heart attack situation and he'd run into the room and he would give them resuscitation whatever and uh, about 82 people had this and uh, 29 people didn't make it the others he saved and became a hero oh he got into the room he saved them from their death but he was the one inducing the death you see many fear pain Pain. We don't like to suffer, do we? I like pain. No, I don't like pain. I'm glad I have pain. Because pain is a good thing. Pain tells me there's something wrong. If I don't feel pain, 
and I do something, and I have great pain. You know, that's why I don't take Advil before I go play a sport, because I don't want the pain to be covered over and then hurt myself even worse. I want to know if I'm hurting. I want to know that it's painful to me. So pain is good, and, and God gave pain, not for us to be discomfort, but basically to take care of all of that. So you and I are facing that whole aspect of pain. I already talked about that. Did Jesus fear death? I'm going to go to the book of Mark. Chapter 14, please. Mark chapter 14. <coughs> Real quickly. See, my time is running out on me here. Verse 32, Mark 14. And they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, John, and began to say and to feel greatly distressed and troubled. He said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. Verse 35. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible that the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Was he fearful of dying? Was he fearful of the pain, of the cross, of the beatings, of the slander, all the humiliation that he would feel? Go with me to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Listen to what it says. <coughs> Verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Look at the next words. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus realized that he was going to have to die on a cross. He realized that he was going to be laughed at and mocked and scourged and pull and pluck his beard out, slapped and beaten. He knew everything he had to face. The Bible says that he endured all of that pain and that suffering, realizing that there was something beyond death. going to be on a throne. He's going to be the king of kings and lord of lords. I want you to know this. Instead of looking at the here and now, be concerned about the future. Look at what God has for you as a Christian. You have hope and assurance and confidence in that if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will be resurrected with a new glorified body, just like Jesus Christ. You have that assurance. You walk around with the assurance. Instead of looking at all the things that are happening in our world or even our communities, seeing all of the garbage that's going on, don't put your eyes on all of that. Some of you listen to the evening news, the morning news, and the afternoon news. And you get so depressed from looking at all that news because it's all bad news. Well, 98% of it. And then you go to bed and you start to fear and worry about all this and that. Why? Because you've been putting into your mind all of this junk. Please don't do that. Just encourage you. You can do what you want. I mean, I mean this is something you have to make a decision. That's why I read the Bible before you go to sleep. Give them something positive to think about to, uh, to put into your heart and mind. You need to understand. 
don't want you to go to bed fearful. He wants you to go to bed hopeful and assured that no matter what happens during the night, and anything could happen to any one of us, I can go to sleep tonight and not wake up tomorrow. I'm okay with that. Are you? I can go to the doctor next week and you say, sorry, boy, you got three days to live. I say, great. I say, what you going to do? I say, I'm going to do what I do and did what I was planning to do. Go play pickleball. I'm going to go uh, my wife on a date. I'm going to do whatever I want. Live like I am going to live forever. Understand. Life has been given to us. We need to take that life and do the very best that we can with it and enjoy every minute of it. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. You know what the word despising means? He thought little of the shame. That's exactly what we need to do. Think little of what is coming up that's bad news in our life. Instead of sitting and stewing about it, thinking about it. It's really important. My brother Bill died a painful, painful death. He chose to do that. It was 80% reason why he died at that young of an age. Greg Fankoviak, Joe Gerdman, a man by the name of Ray in the hospital in Illinois, a woman with cancer in Milo, Michigan, I think it was. People that have died that some of them have been in the very presence of the room. And the family said, you know, I wish that God would take Ray home today. I said, well, let's pray about it. So I went to prayer with the family and, and they were united in that prayer moment when we woke up. Ray was gone. That's how fast God answered prayer for the family. Uh, I can think of people like Del Byer, Dorothy Russell, Gene Sweet, and many, many before that. They were ready to die. They had confidence. They had the assurance of eternal life. Do you? Are you ready to leave this world? And I've given you all these names here, and the list could go on and on. Do you fear death? Proverbs 3.24 says, If you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your, sweet, your sleep will be sweet. Philippians 1.21 says, says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Ecclesiastes 12.1 says, Remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Are you enjoying life? I hope you are. And probably it's because you have trusted Christ as your Savior. Moments to ponder. Death is a reality that you and I will face one day. Whether you desire to do so or not, you and I will face death probably. May Christ be your reason for living as well as dying. Yeah, death is a somber subject, but a real subject. A subject that you and I need to face, look at in the mirror and say, one day, you're not going to be here anymore. You better be prepared to die. I hope you are.
And if you've not trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that you would take the time this morning, not next week, not next month, this morning, to take care of that business of putting and placing your faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe the last day, maybe the last week, maybe the last month you'll ever live in your lifetime. You don't know. Just heard about a young man that ended his life, not because he wanted. Automobile accident, took him out just like that. It doesn't take long. Let's bow in prayer, shall we, as the worship team comes. Are you prepared to die? I don't know. I hope you are. But if not, you can place your faith in Jesus Christ right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for life. And we thank you for the privilege that we will one day live forever. And we will live in heaven if we know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. And we want to thank you for the privilege that we have to live for you. Help us to live with great wisdom, guide and direct our lives in such a way that we might be able to please you and honor you in all things. Father, I pray for each one in this room that they have come to the place of knowing Christ as Savior. And if so, give them the confidence and the joy to know where they are going when they die. Thank you again for the hope and the things that you've promised to us in the word of God. Help us to believe them and live for them. And we'll thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing.